Will South Africa choose the same disastrous policies adopted by Zimbabwe and Venezuela, nationalizing private lands in the name of social justice? They call it radical economic transformation. South African President Jacob Zuma, pushed by Marxist-Leninist radical Julius Malama, is demanding changes to the constitution that would allow the government to seize privately held land. They say they want to redistribute it along racial lines, seizing property from the white minority, giving it to the black majority. Supporters say they are merely righting the wrongs of history, but we've seen this situation play out before. Tensions over land ownership are at boiling point in South Africa. The peaceful redistribution of land that was promised by Nelson Mandela after the apartheid era 20 years ago has largely failed, and that's left millions of black South Africans angry and impatient. The proposed land grab is eerily similar to what happened in Zimbabwe, where the government used the people's justifiable anger at white colonialism as an excuse to seize property and consolidate a totalitarian state. The fastest way to e impoverish the country economically would be to adopt that kind of policy whereby you would have properties being confiscated, being expropriated without compensation whatsoever on a coercive basis. That would be the fastest way for the economy to implode. Besides that being happening internally, it would send a, a negative signal to potential investors out there that this is not the market to which they should aspire to, to direct their investments. So they would look at other markets for them to, 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 to invest in. This is a far cry from the rainbow nation that Nelson Mandela once dreamed of when he was fighting for racial equality. And even now, the Minister of Tourism in Zimbabwe is warning South Africa not to make the same mistakes his country made. Of course, without stable property rights, it's impossible for any country to thrive. And if the South African government follows through on its threats, expect a similar result to Zimbabwe. Widespread poverty, starvation, even death. In the real world, government land reform efforts like these are just a power grab, not justice, racial or otherwise. How does this happen? How does a relatively prosperous nation like South Africa fall down the rabbit hole of tyrannical government? In truth, the seeds were sown a long time ago. It all starts with the policy of apartheid, literally meaning separation. The state imposed racism that continues to cast a shadow over South Africa's entire history. Ayn Rand once wrote that racism is the lowest, most crudely primitive form of collectivism. It says that a man is to be judged not by his own character and actions, but by the characters and actions of a collective of ancestors. She also called it a barnyard form of collectivism, by and for brutes, that treats people like animals, not individuals. Racism isn't a form of government, but it's one of the deadly isms all the same. Throughout history, race has often been a tool of totalitarians, a way of dividing people, and a convenient scapegoat for political opportunists. But there is perhaps no better example of how government uses racism to oppress and divide people than the years of apartheid in South Africa. South Africa had a long history of racial tension before apartheid. When the Dutch colonized the country, they implemented segregation, separating the white colonists from the black natives. But it wasn't until 1948, when the Nationalist Party won the general election and ascended to power, that total government institutionalization of racism began. 
what was called apartheid was what happened after the previous government, the National Party, came to power in 1948. But going right back to the beginning, there has been discrimination in South Africa, uh, racial, after the white colonists landed in 1652, and as between tribes, uh, oppression of one tribe by another, one group by another, uh, so that South Africa has a long history of oppression and discrimination of one group by another. And uh, I, I think it's correct to say that what we think of as apartheid really started right in the beginning in 1652, but the name was given to it and it was formally created into quite a sophisticated policy and eventually quite a brutal policy from 1948. With the Population Registration Act of 1950, the government arbitrarily divided everyone into four classifications, black, white, colored, or Indian. Each group was given its own special legal privileges or restrictions, creating a social hierarchy not unlike feudal aristocracy. Apartheid started out in the public sector only, but it quickly spread to cover almost every aspect of life, governing where you could live, who you could marry, and even what kind of job you could have. There were about a hundred laws that constituted apartheid. It wasn't one law. And they ranged from things like uh, only black people could get a trading license in a black residential area, uh, subject to a radius law that is no more than in those days four miles from another, whereas that law did not apply in a white area. Then there were different laws governing uh, divorce and marriage, matrimony for black and white people. Uh, by the way, that still is the case to this day under, under common law, depending on how, how one works. Uh, but it was a wide range of laws that protected certain jobs for white people, uh, called job reservation, uh, that allowed white people to form trade unions, but not black people that uh, pro prohibited mixed marriage, which my sister was in a mixed marriage. Uh, people of different races couldn't marry. You couldn't play sport together, so white and black people couldn't play football or soccer or basketball or whatever. Um, you couldn't go to the same cinema, you couldn't go to the same restaurant, everything had separate facilities. Uh, there were, you could only run a business if you were in the group area for your race. So it was a range of about 100 statutes or laws or acts that together comprised what was called apartheid. Labor laws like minimum wages and licensing requirements were explicitly designed to keep the non-white population out of the labor force, preserving the best jobs for the ruling white minority. These regulations exist in America as well. And while most people don't think of them as racist, in practice the effect is the same. Those with the fewest skills and the least education get boxed out to the benefit of the governing elites. Good government requires the consent of the governed for legitimacy. In South Africa, there was no consent among the oppressed black population. A racial minority made the rules that restricted opportunity for everybody else. Things got increasingly violent as the oppressed pushed back and the government did whatever necessary to enforce the status quo. When the state loses the confidence of its people, you can always expect it to defend itself. It's why dictatorships and totalitarian regimes are always police states. They always devolve into brutality. As apartheid aggravated popular unrest, the government gave police more latitude to engage in oppression, even murder. Gun ownership was banned for private citizens, and with no means of defending themselves, the unarmed population fell victim to rising crime rates as well as police violence. Of course, there were those that continued to resist, even when doing so risked their personal safety. Nelson Mandela was one of the early leaders of the resistance movement. For his efforts, he was arrested and spent 27 long years in prison. But even caged behind bars, Mandela grew stronger, serving as a symbol of hope and inspiration for black South Africans, demanding equal treatment and dreaming of a better future. Apartheid ended in 1994, and Nelson Mandela, recently freed from his decades of imprisonment, 
was elected president, but the country was in shambles. The fruits of excluding large segments of the population from skilled work and education had finally ripened. And even now, decades later, nearly half of the non-white population remains unemployed. Despite significant political reforms, there's still a lot of work to be done to repair the damage done by apartheid. Nelson Mandela spoke of a rainbow nation, his vision of a country where color doesn't confer special privileges, and where all people can live together in cooperation and peace. One would hope that South Africa's leaders would learn from the mistakes of the past and embrace a culture of individualism and equality. But the new push to confiscate private land is due in part to the false perception that apartheid was an expression of free market capitalism, a perception that continues to drive young South Africans towards the ideas of socialism and even communism. In fact, apartheid was the involuntary imposition of socialism onto the majority of the population. And one of the reasons South Africa was able to survive despite these policies was that, while non-white citizens were burdened with a socialist system that dictated how they could live their lives, whites enjoyed a system of almost totally unregulated markets. The famous British economist Roy Harrod, when he came to South Africa, uh, had he traveled all over the world and he'd seen socialism, communism, fascism, capitalism in practice. And he said when he visited Soweto, he'd seen the most perfect manifestation of socialism that existed on earth. Nowhere else on earth had that degree of state ownership and control of human and non-human resources been achieved. Uh, on the other hand, white South Africans had one of the purest states of capitalism anywhere in the world, completely free to run businesses, free press, free movement, free association. So we had apartheid uh, meaning, in fact, socialism for black people, state ownership and control, the elimination of class, uh, the closest thing in the world to total equality that had been achieved amongst black South Africans and amongst white South Africans, one of the purest forms of free market capitalism anywhere in the world. So it was really two systems in one country. And of course, what we shouldn't forget is the reason why that made white people more prosperous was because capitalism and free markets make you prosperous. And the reason black people didn't prosper is because of socialism. They had socialism. And so nobody in South Africa should have any doubt about which system works and fails because apartheid proved it. You had two systems running for the same country and it was like saying short people will have socialism and tall people will have capitalism in the United States and then see what happens. The solution to South Africa's problems today should be obvious. Extend the freedom that whites enjoyed under apartheid to everyone and everyone will prosper with liberty and justice for all. Can you counter state-imposed racism with more state-imposed racism? No way. But this deadly ism will ensure that everyone loses, except, of course, for the government tyrants in charge.